through uh, for retreats and things as well. So um, that's all I've got in the way of immediate announcements. Um, I invite you to be finding in your Bibles the book of Genesis, the first book uh, in the Bible. The Bible is made up of just that. It is a book of books. Um, really, you get into the New Testament, it's a lot more like letters than books. It is very short uh, booklets, if you will, put together. But uh, we're going to start extremely basic in this. Uh, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 uh, here this evening in our study that we're calling Captivated. Um, on the, the course of the next several weeks, we're going to be handling a lot of issues. And I've said this once, I want to say it again. Nothing, and I mean nothing, is off the table. If you have questions, we're adults, we can handle that. Uh, we will address this because um, there are a lot of issues that I think the church has failed to handle adequately. And I'm not talking about this church, I'm talking about church as a, as a whole has failed to handle adequately when it comes to marriage uh, because we've shied away from it for, for a myriad of reasons, some of them uh, honest and, and, and right. But when it comes to discipleship in our churches, uh, it doesn't do us well, it doesn't do the church well to leave questions unanswered uh, when it comes to issues of relationship, issues of um, Christendom, uh, issues surrounding marriage and everything. Uh, marriage is set up as uh, a, an example of the relationship with of Christ and the church. Just as Christ pursued the church, uh, so marriage was meant to be a, a symbolic form of, of the relationship between Christ and the church. So the relationship between husband and wife is to echo the relationship of a person and, and God himself. That makes this study for everyone. Single, divorced, widowed, married, uh, whatever the case may be, you know, this study is for everyone. And with that being said, I have to go ahead and acknowledge up front, I know uh, in 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 this room and over the course of the next several weeks, I invite you to be inviting folks to take part of this. Uh, but I know that there could be and, and possibly are some sensitive areas. And as much as I want to handle those with the appropriate amount of sensitivity, I don't want to shy away uh, from uh, the, the, the truths that need to be taught and the things that need to be said in context of relationships and marriage. Uh, so. Uh, we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks uh, several different things. That you, each of you have a syllabus, so you know what's going to be coming up in the next couple of weeks tonight. We're going to talk about the meaning of marriage. What does it mean to be married? Um, what is love? And, and we're going to talk about covenant versus consumerism. And we'll, we'll get into all that here in just a few moments. Uh, not next week because of conference, but picking up the following week when we pick back up with our study, Family Matters. Uh, we're going to say, you know, talk about who am I? Who am I in the context of a relationship, in the context of a, a marriage, in the context of a hopeful marriage, in a context of a previous marriage? Um, what is my role in our home? And what is God's plan for our family? Now, we'll probably end up spending about two weeks in this area because that is a whole lot of ground to cover. And uh, I, I don't want to shortchange any of this after that. We'll be moving on to physical intimacy. Um, and, and, and I want to say this um, along the way, like I said, we, we are all, all adults in the room. Uh, I will be respectful with my language. Don't worry about that. I'm not going to be showing videos or anything when it comes to physical intimacy. Uh, nothing like that. So don't be afraid. Nothing to shy back from. Uh, nothing to get all wigged out about. Uh, but we're going to um, uh, address these areas with, um, with, with transparency. So we're going to talk about the role of sex as God defines it. Uh, what is acceptable in marriage and intentional intimacy. Um, after that, we're going to be talking about the long game. And what I, talk, what I mean when I talk about the long game, I'm talking about 
being 80, 85 years old with kids and grandkids uh, surrounding your dinner table at, at a holiday or at a family reunion or something uh, where your example has spilled over for generations and you're still there at that age in that place in your marriage uh, growing uh, in God and growing with each other until, until God calls you home. So we're going to be talking about the long game. Uh, we're going to talk about logs on the fire. I know that's ambiguous. We'll get into that. Investing, decisions, and empty nesting. So we're going to cover a gamut of things over the next uh, several weeks. Once again, I invite your questions, um, and uh, I, I want to make sure that we're ready for this. Uh, so it, hopefully you've got a pen. Um, at one point, I, I tried to put pens in the, in the chairs um, uh, along the, the course of the church, and and, and people borrow those. If you need a pen, I've got a handful of them up here. Um, I'd be glad to, to share one with you. Um, but if not, you can probably grab one out of the, the pew in front of you. Um, but let's get into our study, the meaning of marriage. Now, when I want to talk about the meaning of marriage. Um, there are a lot of things wrapped up in this. Paul, um, the apostle, was a, a single guy. And he would say, uh, he would say, he, he would classify this the sentence. He would say, "Now I'm speaking of myself, uh, telling us that he's he's in that moment he's giving his own personal opinion, not that that is inspired by the Holy Spirit." He said, "But I wish that you would all remain single, uh, because uh, in in singleness uh, you can, can devote uh, more of your time and energy to the work of the ministry of the church." Um, so somewhere down the line. Uh, in, in church history and church life, we've kind of uh, developed this, this vernacular surrounding this, and we, we like to call this the gift of singleness. And we like to make it sound really nice. But here's what I've found. So many people with this gift want to give it back. They, they're like, can I exchange this gift? And, you know, uh, God, you gave me this gift of singleness. I really don't want this, this gift. Can I just exchange this for, for something else, for anything else? Because this is not what I want for my life. The reason that is, is because there is built inside each of us this longing for community. This, this desire uh, to be uh, close and to be... Um, knitted with another human being. And it's a good desire. We've painted it as something different in, in a lot of cases, in, in a lot of churches. We've, we've painted that something differently. Um, but it is a good desire for the vast majority of us we were built for relationship. We were built, we were made for, for marriage. And so in those, those times when singleness seems to be part of who we are, there ends up being this, this longing, this desire for something more, something, something different. So we need to first establish what is marriage so that we can begin to work to for some and to begin to work from for others uh, a, a definition, a, a working thought, a working idea that we can develop this from. Now, I told you uh, a week or so ago uh, that... Um, you know, I could offer you my opinion. I could offer you a definition that I could have set down and pinned out. Uh, but uh, I was taught a long time ago, work smarter, not harder. And Tim Keller had already done that for me. So um, at, at the top of your page, you're actually going to find definition of marriage um, according to Tim Keller in his book um, uh, that uh, the meaning of marriage is the, the title of his book. Uh, you can find this definition. It's, it's a pretty good book, the, the excerpts that I've read from it. Uh, but Tim Keller defines marriage this way. He says, marriage is a lifelong monogamous relationship between a man and a woman. According to the Bible, God devised marriage to reflect the saving love for us in Christ. 
And he begins to flesh out how all that's going to happen. What, what's, uh, what's that going to bring about? It's to refine our character, to create stable human community for the birth and nurture of children, and to accomplish all this by bringing the complementary sexes into an enduring whole life union. I thought he did a pretty good job with that. So we're going to work from this definition as we're beginning to flesh out these thoughts. Before we can define, uh, get into what this definition is going to mean to us, we have to establish uh, the, the base set need, uh, the reason why marriage is, is what it is and, and, and why God established this, this idea of union between a man and a woman uh, from the very beginning. So I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 26. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 26. Then we're, uh, I'm sorry, not chapter 26, chapter 1, verse 26, excuse me. Then we're going to look at chapter 1, verse 31, and then we'll skip to uh, Genesis chapter 2. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis 1, 26 says this, And then God said, Let us make man, in our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. When he says, let us make man, naturally we want to go uh, in our minds uh, to Genesis chapter 2 and, and see that he is making Adam. A man. Um, the language really in Genesis chapter 1, you got to figure Genesis chapter 2 is a more detailed retelling of um, Genesis chapter 1, the last half of Genesis chapter 1. So Genesis chapter 1 is a kind of a broad spectrum. Um, let us make the birds, let us make the fish. You know, um, in the beginning God created the heavens and earth and, and you know, he's working through all the days of creation and there begins to be this rhythm. And you know this rhythm. It says that... Um, God created heavens and earth, and, and the, uh, then he moves on to the light and the darkness and separate them, and the, and the day and the night, um, and all these things. And after every day in creation, God makes this statement. He says, and God said it was, help me out, good. He, he saw that it was good. And so... When we see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, he says, let us make man in our image. He's actually talking, uh, the language here is really let us make mankind. Um, Genesis chapter 2, we see that he made man first. I'm not arguing the fact that he created man first. We're not getting out of any of that. Uh, but the language of Genesis chapter 1, he's talking about mankind. Uh, so Adam wasn't just the only one who was made in God's image. But mankind, humanity, was made in the image of God. Uh, in, in, in seminary, they taught us this word, uh, this Latin word that is carried through Christendom. And it, it just really, it works well to make you look smart when you're preaching or teaching something like this. But outside of that, it really doesn't have a whole lot of um, uh, context outside of just church life. Uh, but it is this idea of imago Dei. Imago Dei, it simply means the image of God. The image of God. And so, as we see, uh, that humanity was made in the image of God. Now, I've got a question on your page there. That after what we just read seems really silly and really redundant. But I really wanted to drive home a point here. Let me ask you this question. Who created mankind? Who created mankind? Now, we just reviewed this. You know the answer. I'm not trying to trick you. God. God created mankind, right? God formed 
mankind. Now, I know that seems redundant. I know I, it seems like I keep repeating the same thing. But I think somewhere along the line, uh, we, we have adopted this, this image of Genesis chapter 2, um, feeding into Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And we'll get into Genesis chapter 2 here in just a moment. But in Genesis chapter 2, um, it goes into a little bit deeper, and it says that God formed Adam out of the dirt of the ground, out of the, the dust of the ground, right? Are you, are you with me? You guys remember that? And so we see the formation of Adam, the first man, um, being formed out of the dust of the ground. But I don't know if in church we just don't give it a lot of thought or we've just allowed this idea, this context to be robbed from us. But you do realize, of course, that when God formed Adam, he made him a man. Are you tracking with me? And when God took the rib from Adam and, and made Eve, he made curves and made her a woman. Okay, are we, are we, are we right? That, that Satan didn't just slip in when God was forming Adam and God decided he's going to go to the kitchen and make a sandwich. That Satan didn't just slip in and attach something to him and say, all right, this is going to drive you for the rest of your life and this is how I'm going to control you. That, that Satan didn't just inject him full of testosterone. That God, in his infinite wisdom, in his good creation, you just said that when he created mankind, he's going to pronounce him as good. That God created man the way he was, and then when he created woman, he created women, he, he filled them with, with, with estrogen and, 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 and made them the way he made them. If this wasn't an accident, if this wasn't uh, some evolutionary faux pas that just happened to work out. By the way, if you want to get into apologetics, asexual reproduction is a whole lot better from an evolutionistic standpoint. So um, at what point did cells decide they were going to split and, and, and continue to split and continue to split to the point that it, it required a male and a female to produce others? If you really want to get to effective evolution, effective evolution says that asexual reproduction is a whole lot more effective than uh, than, than, than two, peop two individuals, two things having to come together uh, to reproduce. Uh, but that's apologetics in and of itself. Um, so when, when God made this, God made us the way we are, man and woman, on purpose. Now we've kind of dropped back from that. We don't like to talk about that kind of stuff in church. We don't like to acknowledge that kind of stuff in church. Um, but that tells me that if he, if he made me the way he made me, if he made man, men, the way he made men, and he made women the way he made women, and, and, and shaped us and molded us the way he made us and filled us with the, um, the different hormones and the things that helped drive us and stuff, that God obviously had a plan for all of that. When he built man... He filled him with testosterone and he built him to pursue the woman. This was to be symbolic of God's pursuit for us. If it is my job as a man to pursue the heart of my wife, God in his infinite creation said that I am making this to represent so that they can get a handle on the idea that I am pursuing their hearts the same way. So we skip down to Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. And we read this. Then God saw that everything, including mankind, that he had made, and it indeed was very good. God was pleased. He didn't say, oops, I made a mistake. He said it was very good, and so the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So how did God classify his creation according to Genesis chapter 1, verse 31? He classified it as very good. Very good. God was pleased with everything that went on. So now if we will, let's skip over to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to pick up in verse 18 and we're going to read through verse 25. 
Genesis chapter 2, 18 through 25. And the Lord said, it is not good, what, what, we'll get to that, that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he could call them. And whatever Adam called them, called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper, helper, comparable to him. Helper, key in on that. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken for Adam, he made into a woman. Whoa, I mean, Ishish. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called, called woman because she was taken out of man. Now you kind of got to get in the rhythm um, of the language in, in, in this case. He's, he's going through in the rhythm of the, the, the context of this. Uh, even if you could read it in a, um, a direct translation from Hebrew, it, it gets this idea that, that God saw that Adam um, needed a, a helper because there was nothing compar comparable for, for him. And then Adam saw that there was nothing comparable to him. And now God has created something comparable to him. So the, the rhythm of the language is, is not like me, not like me, like me. And so we'll talk about that here in just a moment. Verse uh, 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked. And the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful context there. So let's look at this. The first thing that stands out to me was after everything that we just talked about uh, in the creation account, the formation of man, even in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, uh, where God created everything and he pronounced over his creation that it was all, how would we say, very good. But this verse, Genesis chapter 2, Verse 18 sticks out. And it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. This is the first time in the, uh, the narrative of creation that we see this idea of coming on stage that everything's good. God created it was good. God created it was good. God created it was good. Now all of a sudden he's, he's saying that this part is not good. This part is not good. Now, we would um, really do a disservice to come back and say that God created something that wasn't fixed, that wasn't right. But God is not doing that. Um, he, it's not that he went to Adam and said, hey, buddy, how's it going? You just named everything. And, and you know, how, how's, uh, I noticed you, you named that golden retriever. How's that treating you, buddy? Man's best friend, right? Uh, you lonely? Oh, it's, oh man, it's not good that you're alone. No, it was, God did not ask Adam what's going on in his life. God created Adam, and in this creation, in this narrative, remember, the whole picture of marriage is to uh, symbolize God pursuing our heart. So we have to recognize the fact that he had put inside Adam the image of God, Imago Dei, this idea, this thought that he is to pursue but Adam had to get the idea that there was something that was missing from his life. He looks at all creation. That golden retriever's got another golden retriever. And the monkeys, they've got each other. And the giraffes, they've got each other. But there's nothing like me. There's, there, there, there's nothing. And God marches the animals from him and... And he says, in the, in the language in what we just 
just read, it says that there was nothing found comparable. Did you get that? There was nothing found suitable. Let that sink in just for a moment. Adam is looking at all of creation. And he's saying, no, 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 <laughs> no, no. He goes to sleep. He wakes up. He says, yes, please. That one is for me. That, she's got thumbs and everything. It's awesome. Uh, th this, is, this is what I've been longing for. So he begins to pursue. It was not good that Adam should be alone. The, the rhythm of creation seemed to be interrupted. So God created woman. It, it, it's... Uh, it, Ishahal, I think is how you pronounce that in Hebrew. You'll forgive me. But it literally means out of man or out of me. You see, Adam recognized that he was an ish. He was a, he was a man. And so she was made out of man. And so he says, out of me, or uh, maybe a, a more concise translation would be mine. Now that flies in the face of the feminist movement all the way around. That Adam would wake up from his sleep. He would look at what God had created and he would say, mine. But he isn't saying mine in the sense of property. But he is saying mine in a sense of belonging to each other. That there is this... This, this back and forth. As a matter of fact, uh, the Bible says there was not a suitable helper for this. And, and, and boy, you want to you mess with some people? Start talking about wives being created to be a helper to their husbands, a, a helpmate for their husbands. And, and, and people get all up in arms. Um, I was at work earlier today. And apparently, I didn't get to see it myself, but apparently there was this big black snake out in front of the front doors. And, and you know how people go, they start wigging out over that kind of stuff. So there's this big black snake out by the, 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 the front doors. And somebody comes by and, and uh, you know, just being joking, they, they hit me on the shoulder and they say, John, there's a snake out of the front door. You need it for church tonight. And, um, and I couldn't help but laugh. And I told him, I said, well, you got to understand, I'm starting to teach on marriage. So I figured there's going to be a lot of hissing going on anyway. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, you start talking about this helper, that woman was created to be a helper for man. And what happens is in one mind, it is carried to such a subvertive, sub, subvertive context that, 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 the word helper means slave or doormat. Where on the other end of the spectrum, you get a guy who, who takes this and he runs with it. And he, and he says that this means that, that, that she is to, to be my sandwich maker for the rest of my life. And it's just flat wrong. As a matter of fact, the word helper in this state is used throughout the Old Testament in context or in reference to God himself. Uh, is God your sandwich maker? Is God your doormat? The other times that you will find this word used in the Old Testament is in direct context, in direct relation to God himself, speaking of God and man, and it says that uh, this helper is to come alongside of and uplift. Now, all of a sudden, you, don't, you, you lose the idea of, of slave. You, you lose the idea of, of some um, uh, bad or uh, judgmental form of, of, of overruling, a, a mis, misuse of, of biblical headship. No, it, it's to come alongside of, to uplift, to encourage along the way. So, if we're going to do this, we have to see what love is. So now that we've got a working definition of marriage, we're going to talk about love. We've got a lot of 
cover, ground to cover. So I want to move through this uh, relatively fast. Um, when we're pretty familiar with the the Greek language, if you've been around church, you know the eros, the um, the 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 erotic type love, uh, uh, phileo, the the friendship type love, the agape, the um, the uh, unconditional love. Uh, Hebrew actually has many more words than just three or four that that contextualize the idea of love. We uh, in English we do it a great disservice. You know we um, we love our spouses and we love our uh, cars and we love a good cheeseburger and 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 we love that song that just come over the radio and and, and would you agree that all of that is different varying stages of of what we use the word love for as a matter of fact you, you may get on twitter uh and and somebody may post something and you're going to hit the love button on it and and there is absolutely no emotional context or connection with that at all. It's just, it's just how we abuse the word love. So here's three words that I, um, we're going to look at in, in context of love. Uh, the, the first one being raya. Raya is this idea of friendship or attraction. It is that initial spark when Jennifer saw me in the halls of Murray County High School. Um, that 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 uh, that 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 initial um, idea when uh, when when somebody finally come along and uh, a, a mutual friend of ours and said, "Hey, you know, I want you two guys to meet," and I, I got to see who this was, and so I uh, this this raya, this this connection, this friendship, this this initial attraction, this thing that that spawns this idea of wanting to, to get to know this individual a little bit better, to find out if there's any depth at all to them. This idea of raya, uh, a friendship, an initial attraction. And from there we go to ahava. It means um, devotion and commitment. So raya, the, the friendship, the attraction. thing that says, hey, what are you doing this coming Saturday night? Well, maybe I'll be there as well. And, you know, you, you begin to arrange these, you know, so you can just be in the proximity of, of, of each other. You know, when you leave that, that fourth grade level of, of uh, not understanding what's going on, and, and, and now all of a sudden you've come to that, that point where you're recognizing uh, that, that what God made in the opposite sex was good very good as he said and you begin to uh, like what you see and so you uh, you begin to explore it so um, raya leads to ahava ahava is this devotion this, this commitment raya says hey I'd like to get to know you a little better and when something comes up and it's a deal breaker. Uh, you, you pull anchor and you get out of port, right? It's all right. This is this is not. I don't want to be tangled up with this mess. This person has flaws that that I cannot contend with. I I, I don't want to explore this relationship any deeper at all. Then you end up with ahava. Ahava says. That after Jennifer saw me in the halls and we were uh, introduced to each other and we, we went out on that, that, that first date, why in the world she agreed to a second is beyond me. I, I, I'll be honest with you. Uh, September um, will make 18 years that we have been married and that still blows me away that she actually said yes to my proposal and it wasn't a joke that she showed up and because I, I, you know, it, it was just, it was one of those deals that I, but we went on our first date. And on our first date, took it to a parts store because I'm that kind of a romantic. Yeah, 
once again, I don't know why she agreed to number two, but, but she did. She saw something special in me, I guess. Um, but Raya leads to Ahava. Ahava says, I see you're crazy and I'm staying anyway. Ahava is this, it's really a love of the will, isn't it? It's this, this, this thing that says, even those imperfections that sometimes drive me crazy about you, and I don't mean in a good way, I'm not going anywhere. Ahava, I'm, I'm devoted. It's just me, it's just you. Not only am I devoted, but I'm, I'm committed. I'm going nowhere. Which leads to, to Dode. Dode is this, this idea of, of passion. A, a good translation for this uh, would be um, what we did as a church last year in our marriage conference uh, that was hosted by uh, Matt Chandler. It was called A Mingling of Souls. Uh, he actually ripped that from the definition, the Hebrew definition of the word dode. And, and that's, that's the best definition that I can offer you. It's this idea of, a, of, of the mingling of souls. It is the joining of two individuals where, as the Bible would say, the two will become one flesh. That the, you're, you're, you're no longer separable. So ideally, raya leads to ahava that leads to dode, right? Uh, friendship and attraction leads to devotion and commitment, leads to this, this passionate knitting together of two individuals. So when you look at that, you begin to see this whole idea of, of love and marriage being so much more than what it is in 2017. Can we just be honest just for a moment? In, in 2017, in the year that we live in now, marriage is, well, it's centered around romantic fulfillment, is it not? The idea of marriage is centered around romantic fulfillment. When you really get to thinking about it, what that means is it's, it's about me. It's all about me. So we get this idea of covenant versus consumerism. Uh, covenant, what we've been talking about, is committed. Uh, it's a committed agreement. It's a bond. It's a promise. It's a pledge. Consumerism is the promotion of of the interest of an individual. It's the promotion of the interest of an individual. So we, in the society, in the age we live, marriage is more consumeristic than it is covenantial. It says that you adjust to me. Right? You Adjust to me. This gives way, consumerism gives way to this notion of, um, well, I fell out of love. You, you, you fell out of love. You fell out of what? You fell out of love. So, uh, but where's the idea of the pledge? Where's the, the, the notion of the promise? Where is the commitment? Where is the devotion? And the reason that it's not there is because we carry into it this consumeristic idea even into marriage. I want to buy a car, so I go out and I find the car that best suits me, that I like the most, and I'm looking for how it can make my life better. And as a matter of fact, if at some point it begins to break down, I'll just trade it in for a different model. And so we carry that same idea into marriage. Consumerism says, you adjust to me. Covenant relationship says, we adjust to God together. Consumerism says, I am supreme. I am the supreme ruler of my, of my life. 
but the Bible says the two will become one flesh and and two supreme rulers lead to war historically speaking so if God's plan for my life is for him to be the supreme ruler yet I'm trying to be the supreme ruler and she wants to uh, me to make her life better so she wants to be the supreme ruler of of my life and all of a sudden there's two supreme rulers over my life and that leads to war I mean even think about it even the marriage vows the language of the marriage vows is more covenant than it is consumer is it not You've seen them on TV if you've not been a part of them yourself. Think about the marriage vows. To have and to hold. For richer or for poorer. In sickness and in health. Till death do us part. That's covenant language, right? That says that no matter what, I'm going nowhere. That's, that's covenant. What, what, if, what if for once you went to a wedding and you sat down on the pew, either on the bride's side or the groom's side or, or whoever's side, and you're sitting there, and they just said, all right, the bride and the groom have decided to uh, write their own vows, so they're going to recite their own vows. They, uh, they don't like the, the covenant idea of marriage, so they're going to uh, approach the marriage vows with their very consumeristic uh, idea. And for once, they actually just spoke what, uh, what so many people have said with their marriage. And the bride turns and faces the husband. And with a twinkle in her eye, she says, you're going to need to make more than $60,000 a year. And he says, well, you're going to need to say it your same weight. Well, is that... Is that like too real for y'all in the room? Y'all won't even laugh at that one. Um, you, you know what I'm talking about. You would jump up, you would grab your toaster, and, and you would take it and you would return it back to Amazon where you got it because you wouldn't want to devote a penny to this wreck of a marriage that's about to happen. Because you realize there's too many outs there. There, there's too many exit strategies. There's no longer a covenant. By the way, I, I put this in here, and I, I really wanted us to let this sink in. I want you to think about this just for a moment. Do you realize that you pledged before God and witnesses that you understand that this could turn out terribly? Think about it. For richer or for? Help me out. In sickness and in, or I'm sorry, uh, in what and in health? Oh, to what do us part? So you stood before a preacher and you said, I'm acknowledging right here in front of my community and in front of my God that this could turn out really bad. And I'm going nowhere. That's covenant, that's that's promise, that's, that's devotion, that's what we're missing in marriage. Now, I want to say this before we get down to the last part. In all of this, I am not in any way, shape, or form giving way to abuse, violence, manipulative, or unsafe relationships just for the sake of, uh, and I'm not teaching on covenant just to keep you in a dangerous situation. I, I'm, I'm certainly not doing that. If you are feeling unsafe in the relationship that you're in, we as a church need to lean into that. 
We need to help you. We need to create some distance in that so that your marriage can, can have a safe place to begin to heal, hopefully. But in the same breath, I'm not saying run out and get a divorce. If that is you, then we need to, uh, to, to help get you safe and, and put you in a situation where you can remain safe and try to help get you the, the counseling, try to help get your marriage the help that it needs so that hopefully through the hand of God it can be healed and it can be restored and it can be put back together. Because if that's the case, then, then you're, 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 just because you're staying there, you're not, you're not going anywhere. Your, your marriage isn't growing. You're not uh, adjusting to God together. You're adjusting to Him. It's still consumerism. And sir, if that is you, I, I just want to say, uh, I, I, I'm not picking on you. I, I just want to say you're a broken man and you need help uh, from the Spirit of the Lord and, and, and help from uh, a good counselor. You need to help get past this so that you can be the man that God has called you to be because you are abusing a daughter of the King of the universe. And if you think for a moment there will be no repercussions, you're a fool. But now, I also have to say this. Where men are typically more... Um, physically abusive women can oftentimes, not that they can't ever be physically abusive, uh, but, but that is, 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 is few and far between. Uh, normally that, that comes from the female up is normally emotional and manipulative. And that relationship needs counseling, needs help as much as the other one. Because once again, it is a consumeristic mentality and we have to move to covenant. We have to get the help that is needed in this relationship. And, and can I just say something real quickly? Uh, since this is the first study, and I may say this a couple of times over the next couple of weeks. If you are in a marriage, if you are in a marriage and your spouse comes to you, and says, we need to seek some professional help, you do not get the privilege of saying no. Because even if you think things are tracking right, if they're at the point where they're saying, we need help, they're not tracking with you, and you need help. And the best thing you can do is, 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 is take them at that, and, and let's get uh, you past this naiveness and, and, and catch you up with reality so that your marriage can be healed. So, with all of that being said, we're moving from consumerism to covenant in our marriage. We realize where we come from. We realize we were made in the image of God. That when God created us, He created us uh, with a plan. And, and all of these urges, all of these desires that we have as men and women um, are not uh, some fluke. They're not a mistake along the way that God programmed us that way on purpose and that he created us for relationship, he created us for community. Although um, singleness can be a great thing along the way, uh, but the idea is to enter into this covenant relationship, uh, to, to take Raya and go to Ahava that carries us to Dode uh, so that we can have a, um, this, this knitting of souls together and recognize that the vows we made we're a promise, we're an oath, we're a devotion, we're a commitment. And, and not just red tape that you had to go through so that you could live together. Marriage, if entered into a covenant and is treated as covenant, is not this prison that one finds themselves in. Now, Jennifer and I have had our shares of ups and downs. I have made way more than my fair share of mistakes in our relationship. But can I say, 18 years this September, 
I, I, I would do it again and again and again and again. It, it, they've been great. I've, I've got, I, it's been an 18-year sleepover with my best friend. I've got to do life with her. I've got to um, grow with her. I mean, when I say grow with her, I mean literally and figuratively as well as spiritually. We were 19 years old when we got married. We were babies. We were puppies. And so we, we almost literally have grown up together. And so in, in, in this growth that we've shared together, um, she's figured out uh, what's odd and different and eccentric about me, and I've, I've figured out the same things about her. And so, um, you know, we, we, we've been able to uh, navigate around these and, 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 and figure out the, these potholes and, and hopefully along the way help make each other a little bit better, along the way better uh, as individuals, better spiritually. And so uh, the goal along the way is to have this, this dough, this mingling of souls uh, by which we, we can, but, but can I tell you, you know, it's real easy for me, even in, in, in a marriage that I think is, is great, and we may get in the car here in a few moments, and she may say, boy, no, we, we need counseling. Um, but, but in a marriage that I think is great, it still would be easy for me, because even though I recognize we're in covenant, and I'm working toward covenant, living in a consumeristic world, it really can still be easy for me to seek out her flaws more than her strengths. It would. So here's what I want us to do. We're going to take about three or four minutes. We should have a PhD in our spouse's strengths, even though it is much easier to pick out their flaws. So for the next three or four minutes, here's what I want us to do. I want everybody to do this. Uh, spouse, or, or if you have a potential spouse, uh, or, or, or maybe you're in this area where you need to uh, recognize uh, the, 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 your own strengths in this moment. I want you to list four positive attributes, strengths, of your spouse. I want you to take three or four minutes, and I want you to jot down four. Give me four. John, I'm going to need all night for this. Give me four. Four strengths, four positive attributes of your spouse. Go. About two more minutes. One more minute.
four positive attributes, four strengths. Uh, hopefully you've got those by now. Hey, you've got homework. I want you to take these four traits that you just wrote down. Because if you've got this PhD, if you've got this, uh, if you're spending more time uh, in covenant, focusing on and being the help, coming alongside and uplifting that person that uh, you're married to, then if you got four listed, maybe you've got more than that, run with more of it. I, I promise you, there has never been a spouse in the world who said, no, just keep it at four. If you got more, offer more. But I want you to tell them the strengths you just listed. I want you to go home, and, and maybe you won't space it out over the next couple of days. You don't want to make your head swell too much in one evening. I get that. You know your, uh, your, your area better than I do. But I want you to take some time. Maybe it's in a text message. Guys, you know, I'm no, song of, I'm no Solomon writing Song of Solomon and, and, and got all that kind of game that I can offer you. Uh, but, but can I give you maybe a little... A um, little something that maybe you can, can off, that I can just help you out with. Uh, ladies, this works for you guys well. Uh, he, he won't act like it, but it does. Um, send him a little text. He says, you know what? I love this about you. Just a little, a little something. Uh, maybe tell them in the car. Maybe when you notice them um, using this trait, whatever it is, maybe you tell them at that point. But over the next couple of days, I want you to make sure you take some time and tell them these things. You don't have to sit down and say, all right, I want to tell you what I wrote down because John told me. No, that, that like ruins it. All right, just, just work it in. And just tell them. And be looking for more. Be looking for more. And tell them that too. I promise you, it'll leave you both captivated.